Let's go ahead. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our our guests to uh, NCPC for today's brown bags. And for those of you from staff, hello. Uh, make yourself comfortable. Uh, today's presentation, I think, is 40 minutes, half an hour? Yeah, to yeah. tell me how long you want it to be, and I'll Very go fast or slow. OK. Um, and then we'll have some uh, Q&A to follow. Uh, we're videotaping today's meeting um, so that other folks can enjoy it. So when we get to the Q&A, if you're um, here, use the microphones. There's just a little dot. Or we'll bring a mic, a mic around to you. And that way your, cap your questions get captured on the video, and it makes it a lot easier for folks to understand what your question was. Um, we're so pleased to have Camilla Ween back in the office for the second, her second visit to NCPC. Uh, Camilla is an architect who worked until 2011 for Transport for London, advising the Mayor of London on the impact of land use development. Currently, she is the director of Goldstein Ween Architects, where she is responsible for urban design and transportation planning. Her work includes projects for London Underground and public realm projects in London. She's also an author and writing mainly about sustainable cities. Um, and her chapter on sustainable initiatives in London was recently published in Green Cities of Europe. And I believe you're now working on two books on sustainable planning and the integration of public realm projects into mega infrastructure uh, planning. Uh, she is the vice president of the Women's Transport Seminar, which promotes women in the transportation industry, and chair of the trustees of the Spacelink Learning Foundation, <laughs> which encourages interest in science studies in schools through engagement with space technology. Um, Camilla is truly a thought leader. Uh, when she was here last year, um, she told us um, quite a bit about the work going on to transform some of London's underground stations um, and reconnect, uh, use the public space in those areas to reconnect communities to and through those facilities. Uh, today, she's going to focus on what's happening in London uh, regarding sustainable public realms. Um, and I think, uh, I know that for those of us here working in the Washington area, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. And we've all spent a lot of time trying to think about how to take uh, Washington's um, rich abundance of public spaces and figure out how to make them active, vibrant, and sustainable. So I hope we'll be able to learn some incredible lessons from uh, Camilla's work. Um, I also wanted to just note that uh, Camilla is part of a mini British invasion uh, that is hitting NCPC. Uh, last week we were joined by uh, two Londoners, Robert Taverner and John Worthington, uh, to discuss building heights at our Heightened DC panel. And next month we'll be joined by Helen Marriage, um, who uh, will be talking more about ephemeral art and work she's done in London. So. Um, I guess you're just part of this larger wave. We're so looking forward to what you have to say, so please join me in welcoming Camilla Ween. Thank you, Julia. Great, so let's see if we can get this thing started. Hmm. Nothing's happening. Which button? Okay. Let's go yeah. back a bit to the beginning. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, but it's not on the screen. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'll, when the next slide comes up, I'll rem remember what I'm going to tell you about. But um, I think primarily it will be about how the planning system has been written to, to ensure that all our development in London is sustainable. Um, so um, I'll tell you just a little, very quickly about London. I'm sure most of you know this, but it's important to sort of understand the background of it. And then talk a little bit about sort of ecological footprint, because I think that's the sort of starting point that helps you to really believe in what you're doing. Um, and then the sort of development policy and how sustainability is really enshrined in all the different aspects of the policy. And then at the end, I'll go through some examples. I realized when I looked at it quickly this morning, I've got quite a lot on housing, and I'm not sure how interested you are in housing. So I'll go through the two big, and they're quite similar. So I'll go through the first one, perhaps with a little detail, and, and I'll either skim the second one or skip it all together. Um, so, I mean, I think the key thing about London is, is it's very diverse and multicultural. So you know, 250 languages are spoken in London. There's 
almost, you know, every, every different ethnic group across the planet is, is represented in some way in London. Um, and it's a layered city, so you've got, got the old and the new kind of juxtaposed very closely together and often vying for visibility and competition with each other. Um, but there's been a steady expansion of London. So London has been a growing city for 2,000 years, and it's kind of comfortably managed that. Um, so 610 square miles, so it's, it's a relatively large city. Um, I think the key thing that you will probably be aware of is that in the 30s they introduced the Green Belt because there was suddenly, with, with the arrival of uh, the underground system, metro system, the, which were going further and further out, and effectively developers were just paying for the underground to go up further and further out of the centre and then create these new suburbs, some of which were quite wonderful, were laid out in the 30s, but there was a sudden realisation that if this just went on and on and on, London would just grow across the whole of the British Isles. And so there was a realisation you need to introduce it. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I've got a picture of that. And, but then, of course, you know, the Great Fire of London destroyed half of London, and then it rebuilt itself. And then the Second World War damaged just enormous. When I first came to London, and when I was 16, I just couldn't understand why there were parking lots absolutely everywhere. You know, every third building was a parking lot, and those, of course, were bomb sites which now have all disappeared, I mean, every single one. So this is the green belt. It also actually incorporates all the green space, but you can see how there is this sort of continuous ribbon of green around the outside, and basically all that green space around the edge is you just simply cannot build in it. So even though there are houses in it, because there were old historic villages and buildings, but if you want to enlarge your house, oh my God, it's almost impossible. So it has forced the development inside, and then you've got a whole mess of greens, the slightly darker green are sort of parks and open space. So we've got a very high proportion of open space. Um, and I th an interesting part of the planning policy is that actually we have to add to that. So even though we've got 46% open space on the land surface, as you come forward with new development, you're required to add to, because with a growing population, obviously, you need more open space so to accommodate that. So every development proposal has to demonstrate how it's adding to the open space that's already there. Bisected by a river, so that's kind of interesting. Predominantly, the development in the past was on the north of the river. Gradually, it is trickling down south. Now, it is covered by bridges, I think, I can't remember now, I used to know how many bridges there are. Oh, it says 30 bridges across. So, um, you know, it, it is well connected, and yet there is this classic stereotype that the North, North Londoners never come to South London and vice versa and don't know each other's domain very well. Um, and the myth about rain, it, you know, yes, we have quite a bit of drizzle and grey, but actually we don't really have that much rainfall. And in fact, we had a, a drought last uh, it, February, March, April, May, I think it was, last summer, where there was uh, an official drought, you weren't allowed to water, and that was because all the sort of aquifers and supplies, we'd had 22 months of very low rainfall prior to that, so it's, it is relatively dry. Um, I mean, London is centre of the economy, um, so that's in a very important role, and, and a huge part of the economy is tourism, and it, it sees itself as, as, the, as the head of, of the United Kingdom and the, the number one city. But despite that, it has huge pockets of deprivation, and actually the deprivation indices in some of these pockets within London are not just bad, but are the worst in the country. So you have extreme po poverty just opposed with wealth. Um, so the interesting thing, when I started talking about London about three years ago, we were saying we were 7.6 million growing to 8.6 in 20 years. Uh, the census figures were released at the end of last year, and it showed that we'd already reached eight. So the question is, we're probably going to hit nine or even more in the next sort of 20 years. So, so that's an issue, but we do know that we're growing um, mainly low rise. I mean, the interesting Royal Bower of Kensington, Chelsea, even though it's very low rise, there's so mainly six or eight stories, but actually has a higher density than New York City. Um, travel, travel's the biggest challenge for London. So, uh, even though we have an incredible transport system, the you know, the number of journeys uh, every day is phenomenal. The, the underground alone 
uh, recently, I think, reached its highest ever figure for a single day, 4.1 million journeys on a single day. It's staggering. And of course, the, the existing infrastructure can't really cope. I mean, it's, it's everything is pretty much getting close to capacity. Um, so I don't know how familiar you are with the concept of ecological footprint, but I mean, the interesting thing was some work was done by Herod Girardet um, back in the late 90s, sort of, and I think in 2000 the study was released, but it said that London was effectively couldn't survive as it was without having 125 more Londons to support it. Um, and uh, the stu this study in 2000, <coughs> I mean, I th it, it's sort of frightening when you look at it, and I think it was a real wake-up call for London and for the then mayor who came in, Ken Livingston, uh, that we had to tackle this issue of, of kind of basically raping the rest of the world to support our, our lifestyle and that we needed to cut back. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a big issue. And I think uh, all the, the first London plan, the first thing that Ken Livingston was charged with was to write the London plan. Um, and I think the, the, the footprint study was, was actually in, at the center of the work. You know, there were so many things that we had to deal with. But it was about travel, but it was about CO2 emissions, uh, which even in 2000, there was so much skeptic skepticism about, but Ken Livingston really believed in it and, and was very serious about tackling all these issues and that we needed to use less energy uh, and do things more sensibly in the future. Um, so the first document, this was required by the bill that the first first document that the new mayor had to produce was the London plan. And the, this particular picture is actually the third London plan. So we had the first one came out, was actually adopted in 2000. So it took four years to go through its process of being drafted, public consultation, which is required in the UK. Um, the right for people to object or make changes, saying either it's it's too rigorous or it's not rigorous enough, all of that. That took four years to 2004. It was then revised again in 2008, partly because I think Ken Livingston had become even more aware and more convinced that climate change was, was a very, very serious issue and that the first plan wasn't perhaps strong enough to deal with that. And then this is Boris Johnson's plan, which was released and uh, finally adopted in 2011. Um, and it's, it's a spatial development plan, and it's about how, how do we accommodate the growth, basically, sustainably with, within London's borders. Um, I, I mentioned climate change. I think uh, very strong emphasis on design, that, that we should use good design to improve the quality of life, and a very heavy emphasis on transport, that transport has to be good, it's got to have sufficient capacity, and it's got to be attractive and easy to use, and you've got to f facilitate walking and cycling, uh, but also to incorporate green infrastructure. So this, what I already mentioned about development, having to provide new open space, but that you actually want to link all the open spaces. So if you want to walk greater distances, you can predominantly kind of walk those longer journeys through green spaces. Um, also a lot about corporate social responsibility and safety and security so that it's it's a livable city. Um, I think the early years, it was very much talking about a shift away from cars. There was a huge understanding and a very strong lobby from the business district, the central business districts of sort of the city and, and Canary Wharf, that, the, that London was just absolutely at gridlock. I mean, the road speeds were then lower than in Victorian times. And, you know, it was having a huge impact on the British economy. So there was a sort of high understanding that we had to somehow think about what were we going to do with that. And Ken Livingston, you know, introduced the congestion charge, and he said he'd sink or swim on on the basis of that policy. And all his advisors were telling him, "Don't do it." Right up to almost the day before it opened, he was being told, "This is political suicide. You must not do it." And he said, "I don't care. I really believe we have to do this. We have to try it and see what happens." And I'll talk a bit about that. But I mean, it, it was necessary. But he also put a huge investment quickly into buses. Uh, because that was a sort of quick and easy fix to improve the public transport system uh, and give more capacity to the system overall. Um, so there's also a mayor's transport strategy. So that looks at 
or the transport. Um, so it's a sort of parallel document to the London plan, but it goes into much more detail about transport. So it's look, but you know, emphasis being on getting the systems that we do have better integrated, thinking about more Thames crossings in terms of transport. We've got the bridges, which serve roads and uh, people and pedestrians, but there are not enough services that cross the river properly. And there are parts, particularly in the east end of London, Tower Bridge, if you can imagine, Tower Bridge is sort of just a little bit to the east of the centre of London. And after that, if you go east, there are no more bridges. There's one sort of tunnel underneath and stuff like that before you get right to the outside where the, the highway. So the need for better integration. Um, I think smoothing of traffic has been Boris Johnson's idea. He didn't really want to clobber the private motorist in the same way that Ken Livingstone was willing to. So he, he said more, we're going to smooth traffic so you don't sit in traffic jams. So we're going to figure out ways to spread all this demand, which clogs up when it gets to the center. So spread it out. So it's about sort of tweaking traffic lights and putting in turning so you don't get the sort of bottlenecks and stuff like that. And safety and security and actually travel demand management's all been kind of center of it. Um, CO2 emissions. I mean, the interesting thing is that um, the first study that Ken Livingston did, he sort of realized, he, his study showed that actually if, if we just carried on business as usual, but did it a bit better, you know, we could achieve 30% cut in emissions. So the 60% was a sort of much higher target, which would require innovation and doing things in a different way. Um, a lot of emphasis on decentralized energy and, and simply changing the way we live, but not the quality of our lives. Um, waste is, is a big issue. And in fact, London is now required to process 85% of its waste within its borders. It cannot go, only 15% can go to landfill. So n new and innovative uh, processes have been required to, to figure out how that could be achieved. Um, and it's particularly about sort of it's not just the recycling, but actually thinking how you can convert materials from one to another, um, reduce CO2 emissions, and at the end of the day, what has to be incinerated is then convert the heat is converted to electricity. So, in a sense, even the incineration is not wasted. Um, I think the sort of biodiversity issues is also <coughs> goes throughout the London Plan is really important, and it's about people being connected to the planet, understanding where their food comes from, understanding how the world works. And so the need to both retain the biodiversity sites within London, but to improve them, enhance them, and increase them so that children and, um, and, and adults can actually enjoy them and learn from them. Um, and there are certain requirements within the strategy which says that you, you can't actually build that would cause a loss of, of biodiversity or wildlife habitat. So if you do disturb them, you have to replace them and so on. Uh, but they're all Londoners should be within walking distance of you know natural open space, so not manicured parkland, but some sort of place where you would actually see birds and insects and the like. Um, so. Putting the sort of policy into action, I mean, there's a number of initiatives that run through the London Plan. This is just a little part of it, because um, actually if I showed you the green grid for the whole of London, it's, it, you can't even make it out at, at this scale. But the idea is of having the sort of green grid of connected green spaces across London, they're interconnected. Um, and that's both for people to want to sort of migrate through green space rather than say along uh, you know, a major, transport artery, but also for animals and biodiversity to be able to sort of spread around. Decentralized energy, I don't know how familiar that is as a term to you here, but what we're trying to do in London is to create sort of local energy centers so that when you have new development and you sort of keep the, the heat that you generate from one process locally and use it for other things. So for example, if you're generating heat for electricity, you can then use capture the heat to heat water, to heat houses and so on. So various sort of heat sources are being identified. Um, and then that heat is actually being used to, to actually heat homes and schools and, the, and offices and so on. So there's a sort of pilot which is being developed. There's a, 
on the east of the map, the big yellow blob is sort of Barking Power Station, which is a huge power station, feeds a, a significant part of London's requirement for electricity. The heat from that plant was actually just being thrown into the river. So hot water that was, it was partially cooled and the hot water was just being poured into the River Thames. Now all that water is being captured and it's actually being pumped. So it's a, uh, just like a, an ordinary water main, but this is a hot water pipe is it, uh, being laid out, which then eventually feathers down into much smaller, goes into local streets and houses. So the central heating for the houses is, is coming from this plant. So it's basically free energy, which normally, you know, traditionally we'd just thrown away. Um, transport is, is the huge problem. I mean, the, the volume of, of of demand for, for movement within the city is huge, and we know that it's going to rise and rise and rise. So, I mean, 20 to 30 percent growth by 2030 is pretty terrifying when you think that every train that comes into London at the moment in the morning is jam packed. Um, huge numbers of bus journeys. You could increase buses, so we can probably get more buses into the network, uh, but the tube at the moment is close to capacity so there's not a lot you can add to it but you can make it more efficient so uh, some of the newer network they've managed for example the jubilee line uh, 10 years ago i think they had 23 trains an hour i think they now have 33 trains an hour so they've managed by improving the signaling but it's you can't continuously keep adding capacity to uh, an underground network so you have to think about alternatives as well um I think high-speed high rail um, is is interesting. I think the Crossrail project, I, th I can't remember if I talked about that last year, but ha I should have put a map in here. But I mean, it's basically an underground rail system in the centre of London, which interchanges with the existing underground system. But then, at, and if you think of it as a, a rope that frays out at the end, so it, it feeds out into the rail systems in the east and the west, it actually connects them. All the rail systems up until Crossrail, well still, because it's not open yet, feed into the centre of London. There's one line that kind of has a kind of dilapidated kind of route to, that it can make its way through London. So this will give you high speed capacity through the centre of London, very long trains. I think they're over a quarter of a mile long, nearly half a mile long. So, you know, the station exits are kind of two or three city blocks apart. Um, but it will feed in, so it will be very high speed, very high capacity. I think there are 12 or 15 carriages on each train, so you can carry a lot of people, but they can then get off and interchange with the rest of the network. And particularly the benefit will be that people coming in from Heathrow Airport will be able to get to Canary Wharf now in about half an hour instead of probably an hour and a half that it used to take. Um, one of the interesting, I think this is a really key sustainability initiative that's come out of the Crossrail project. The project went through Parliament in 2007 and I think was granted what we call Royal Assent, which means it's been signed off in early 2008. But that, so it was before the sort of financial meltdown. But even so, Gordon Brown, the then Prime Minister, was obsessed with not spending anything on public services. And in fact, he'd done a PPP for the London Underground, which was a complete disaster and failed and fell apart. But he didn't want to spend a lot on this project. But this project had been on the drawing board for 20 years. And everybody was telling him, the financial districts were saying, you know, you've got to do this project. London just ain't working anymore. So he, the project was pared down and pared down to something that was kind of a small enough bite that he could chew. And so the project went ahead. But one of the things that what the bill said was, well, when you guys cross around, when you finish digging up the street, you just got to put back some tarmac, stick back the traffic lights, and that's enough. So there was a little bit of money set aside at each station to kind of repair what had been undone. And what Londoners said, the so stakeholders at all the stations said, that just ain't good enough. We're not going to accept that. You can't do that to the city. You can't inject this massive infrastructure and just think that you just repair it and leave it dysfunctional the way it's just, uh, many, many of these places are already dysfunctional. So local stakeholders came together. So it was Transport for London, it was the local authority. So this is Tottenham Court Road Station. 
uh, the, down the middle of the street are, is the bar boundary between Westminster and Camden, so two boroughs were involved. The, um, the building center point is actually listed, so English Heritage was involved. And then there are about five or six major developers clustered around this kind of open space, which used to literally be a traffic island. So uh, you've got the glass boxes are where you come out of the new station, so you come out into this public space. That used to be a massive fountain that you couldn't get to or even really appreciate. And the traffic went around in a sort of gyratory one-way system, high speed, you know, you couldn't cross the street. There were no crossing points. I mean, it was a nightmare. So the project was designed. So the stakeholders said, right, what are we going to do about this? We're not willing to let this opportunity slip through our hands. So we're going to get designers to design a public realm scheme that provides all these links. And in fact, if you can imagine a diagonal space through that line, it takes you from Oxford Street, the sort of commercial centre of, of uh, London, you know, the high shopping street, and diagonally through that space and down to Covent Garden, which is a, another very trendy and very popular commercial area. Uh, very difficult to get to at the moment. You'd get lost and you have to go through little back streets and so on. So they were very isolated as places. So the uh, premise was that you had to have that sort of diagonal movement through, which is why there's a space in the middle of the box that comes up for the station exit. And that the crossroads, which at, at the moment you have to kind of hug the outside and their railings and it takes forever and it's a miserable experience. The idea was you'd have an all red phase so that you could cross diagonally across that. So this has been designed. Now the interesting thing about it is that uh, Crossrail had a million pounds set aside to put back the tarmac and the traffic lights. And this scheme is going to cost about five million, but it's actually the money is secured from various sources of so Transport for London and you know the developers are all making their contributions and so on. So this scheme will be de delivered. And I'm sort of writing an article about this, which will come out, I think, in, in May in Transport Times, which is looking at several case studies. This, this not just Tottenham Court Road is a good example. And I, I work closely on it, so I'm kind of wedded to it emotionally. But the, the, across the network, uh, the station, at every station, the sort of opportunity, are there barriers? Can peop are people being frustrated to go where they want to go? So new, new sort of links were opened up, and sometimes it's a, a footbridge, or sometimes it's a cycle bridge, sometimes it's just removing a building that didn't really need to be there, you know, so different things. So that's just, that was sort of collaborative thinking and collaborative effort, which I think is a really interesting way an easier way very often of delivering projects when everybody is on the same page and wanting to do it. Somehow the money seems to flow in a bit more easily. Um, I mean, there's the issue about buses that Margaret Thatcher, I know this is going back a bit historically, but I mean, she said, I think back in the 80s, that, you know, if you're 26 and still riding a bus, you're a loser. I mean, she, and so, you know, anybody who wanted to be anybody wasn't going to be seen dead on a bus, and bus ridership really plummeted. So the bus usage probably halved from what it had been in about the 1960s. And they were, and then she sold off the buses and the bus infrastructure and, you know, franchisees were coming in and running the buses very badly. So when TfL was set up, that was all changed and Ken Livingston said, no, the London buses are one of the best things we have, but we need to improve them. We need to provide uh, bus lanes so that buses have predictable journey times because that was part of the problem is that if you're going to work you never knew if your bus journey was going to take 10 minutes or two hours I mean it, slight exaggeration but I mean it could easily be 20 minutes and, and an hour and a half you know, that, that was that variable so people wouldn't use the buses so predictable journey times by providing bus lanes was a very important aspect of it so 300 kilometers of bus lanes were put in and the ridership rose phenomenally and of course then you had the real-time information on board buses and so on so people knew where they were going um the congestion charge so, i mean this is really interesting because obviously the first phase of the congestion charge came in it was an overnight success the predict everybody predicted doom and gloom and it was going to be a disaster but in reality it was just incredible and suddenly London, central London became quiet and you, you could get places and it was just skimming off that sort of 15, it dropped back to about 15% reduction in the traffic, it made such a difference. So then Ken Livingston was very confident and he decided to extend it west and it's a very obvious thing if you've done the sort of transport planning and analysis that 
the west is where, of London is where everything's clogged up. And so he did a western zone. When Boris Johnson came in, he campaigned on getting rid of the western zone because all his buddies lived in the west. Um, and I think he probably didn't understand how important the western zone was overall and so had, has had it removed. So we know back to the central part. However, my, the work I did up until I left TFL a year ago was showing that when we looked to 2031, which was our horizon at that point, everything was gridlocked. And that was without adding the development. And then we were adding development on. And we were actually fine in despair. And it was, we kept coming back to, if only we had the congestion charge, but we weren't allowed to say that. So uh, there was a real tension, and I, I think, quite frankly, I think the Western congestion zone will probably come back at some point, probably with the next mayor. If Boris runs again, I don't know, but I suspect he probably won't. He's had two terms now. So, and and pr I predict that probably in 20 years' time, the whole of London will be a congestion charge zone. But the interesting thing was, I mean, if you just look at the figures, was uh, overnight you had a 21% reduction in traffic. And a 30, but that net gives you a 30% reduction in actual congestion. So that, I think that was interesting. It's just you have to strip out a little bit of the traffic to get traffic moving again. Uh, but you also had all sorts of other benefits of so better air quality and um, less accidents and so on. Because obviously when you can see a bit better, everybody can see each other. Walking, there's been a huge emphasis on walking and improving walking. Uh, Ken Livingston said he wanted it to be the most walkable city in the world. Um, so th the idea of, of pedestrian crossings over the river, but also the public realm projects that are all linked up should all be sort of part of making it the walkable city. But one of the things were why people weren't walking was that then, because it's a lot of it is a medieval city and so we're not on a grid, so it's not as easy as kind of here. And here in DC, it's so easy, you know, you're going to go from 9th to 7th, dead easy, I can figure that one out. But, you know, if you want to go around the corner to find a really important shop that you've got to go to, and you have no idea how to do it. So they devised maps, and these maps are exactly the way you'd hold your map if you were trying to figure out where north is and where you're going. So it's not north at the top it's if you're looking down the street it could be east or southwest or whatever so it's exactly the way you're facing and you say right i go down the street i turn right there i am i've got it and these have been put up all over london and phenomenally useful so they've got a bigger area map and a closer in map and and key places are signposted and it will tell you how many minutes it takes to walk there so people just walk along from one to the other and they kind of figure their way around so it's really made it easier it's also had an incredible impact on people's perception as to how far they can walk. They would get in the tube to go one stop or two stops. Sometimes it's shorter to actually walk on the ground than actually to use the tube. So again, you know, stripping out those sort of short, unnecessary journeys was important. Travel demand management, I'll go through this really quickly, but it's about sort of talking to people and getting them to understand what, how they travel and, that the, and giving them good green choices about how they travel. So thinking about the, the pilot study, um, you know, really showed that when people understood that instead of taking their car and parking it somewhere and then getting on a bus and all this, that actually if they walked or if they cycled a bit further to a really good network that takes them straight to where they want to go, that actually that's a much better choice. And then they understood also the carbon savings of their journeys. And there's been a lot of work at TFL on that. Um, low emissions, the whole of London is a low emission zone so that if you come in with a dirty old truck, you pay £200 a day to enter the zone. So it's a hefty penalty. Um, and the picture is actually also a experimental sort of damping of dust and particles to try. So I, I don't think the result of that study has been published yet, but it's all the time think about how can you improve air quality for people. Um, waste is a huge thing. I mentioned already that the 85% has to be processed within. So uh, an example is the London Eco Park, which has been innovative in thinking about every single thing go that goes in there has a use. So everything is sifted out and separated so that you get the recycling. You, all organic waste is composted within six weeks. It comes out and it's, 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 it's meat products from restaurants as well as uh, green clippings and stuff like that. And this stuff, I mean, I've been there and they put it in my hand and there's no smell. I mean, it's incredible, but they speed up the process. So they look at that. They look at um, 
you know, ge then generating the electricity and so on, and, and the incineration as is used for highways. So everything, so their, their principle is that it's 100%, that it's not even the 85%, it's everything that goes into, into the plant is going to be used. Um, another, this is an interesting one, um, which is an underground waste system. It's a Swedish system that was, done, it's not that new. I think it was invented in the 1930s or 40s. But it, underground waste evacuation. So this is a new development at Wembley, which is sort of north of London, huge development. And they installed it there. So basically, you have around the development, around the depart apartments, you have these bins, so everybody in the apartments and you move into the apartment, you're given different colored bins for sorting it. So you already do the sorting in your apartment and then you take it down, so you put bottles and plastic go into one, you know, general waste in the other and so on. They just drop down and when the bins under the ground, so you don't see them, they are below ground, but when they're full, they automatically open, they trigger an, a vacuum system that then sucks all the stuff away at high speed to a central point within the development, so it's maybe a quarter of a mile away or something, and it all goes straight there, and so it all goes into the recycling or all goes into the other bin, whichever it is. And so then when, the, when it's collected, basically the, the truck, the waste truck, only has to do one pickup, as opposed to kind of going around the whole estate from bin to bin to bin to bin. So the savings on, on journeys and on CO2 emissions has been huge, and that's we're encouraging that. It is a little bit expensive initially. Obviously, it's, it's a higher cost to install it than to not. But if you think of it over 30 years and the environmental and public realm benefits of not having garbage at the surface is phenomenal. Um, open space and biodiversity, I'll speed up a bit because I think, where's my, yeah. Um, <laughs> This, this was a site that was a former sewage plant, so big concrete tanks um, had been empty, was disused. Uh, it's kind of in the heart of London, it's quite close to where I live on the River Thames there. And basically it was converted into a biodiversity plant and as a result now it attracts migrating birds from Europe and Northern Europe and it has the highest um, you know, amount of varieties of species and visiting sort of dragonflies and little animals and stuff like that. And But the great thing about it is it's open to everybody. So children in the, all the local schools go there and they can see things happening at different times of the year, but adults can just go in and, and enjoy it as a beautiful <coughs> place because that's what it looks like, or and they can learn so that it's also an information centre. So I think, you know, using those kind of terrible old places they can with just a little effort and not huge investment this was done by a trust can be converted into nice places that are rich for our living environment um trees are obviously very important for both co2 but also for collecting particulates in the air and boris johnson has pledged a million trees so there's a program of planting trees across the whole of london um very important initiative i think um, sustainable housing. I mean, this, I'll go through this quite quickly, but it's a very interesting thing. Already back in the 90s, there was this sort of thinking, uh, there was an organization called Carbon Neutral, and it was sort of thinking, can we actually reduce our emissions? Um, and so Bioregional was sort of set up as a company, and their first housing development that was a demonstration project of their thoughts and beliefs is called BedZ. Um, and they devised this thing called a One Planet Living, which has sort of, and it's been adopted by the World Wildlife Fund and others. And it's it basically sort of saying there are 10 principles, and these are the principles that you basically, you know, you've got to reduce calm, but you've got to have sustainable water. You know, the whole mix, you can read it all later, but it's get, it's getting a, getting to a point where our built environment and our housing actually su supports that and gives a improves the quality of life, ensures that the future generations, so that we're not raping the earth for, t for our own satisfaction, but that we're kind of living within our own means. Uh, and this is bed Z, so it ha it's a, was an experimental development. It hasn't been 100% successful, but then every innovative project r rarely is. I mean, 
and some of the things having to be tweaked, but it's got solar panels and it's got, you know, biomass boilers and, and passive ventilation and, you know, all the waste and things that are well connected to transport and all the rest. So it was a sort of innovative example. And what it that was led by uh, Bill Dunst, their architects, um, and it's led, it sort of demonstrated that you can do it and it demonstrated to developers that, you know, these aren't necessarily nice to have extras. You can actually develop, still make a profit, and actually build all this in if you're thinking about it from the outset, not adding it on at the end, but actually it's core to your thinking. Uh, and that led to uh, a toolkit being developed that basically explains how you do it, which is, um, you know, quite an extensive document. Um, and then it has, you know, talks a lot about the construction materials as well and how you deal with that and how you deal with construction waste. Um, these sort of principles of sustainability have been pushed by the GLA and um, there have been a number of um, sort of exemplar developments that were being assisted, so partly funded by what used to be the London Development Agency. It's now, it doesn't really exist anymore, so the mayor's funding for development is sort of absorbed into the mayor's office and there is obviously much less funding as you can imagine um, so how in the future but I think it was important to invest in these as demonstration projects so people could understand that actually it was possible and this is a project called One Galleons there's a, a loop the River Lee which is the river that went through the Olympic Park and it has this incredible sort of peninsula the river kind of doubles back on itself so this that that's a site plan and that the bottom one is the vision and the top one is is the sort of as built um, planting not quite mature yet um, but the key thing was you know the construction first of all that there would be locally sourced materials and that you reduce waste so any demolition it, you know if the buildings that are on the site are crushed up and they're used for landfill and so on on the site um, landscaping you know will include those sort of recycled materials and so on um, and the energy has it has a sort of combined heat and power unit. Um, the, the aim is to be, you know, net zero CO2 emissions. Um, a lot of, you know, sustainable energy um, features within the building. Uh, sustainable travel was core to it. So, like, you have very easy access to public transport. The interesting thing that map you saw the site plan was actually cut off from the tube, it was on the other side of the river. So footbridge was put across so that you could actually get to the tube. Um, cycle parking was provided everywhere so everybody has the potential to have a bicycle as well as visitors getting there and very limited car parking um, and a car club. And the idea of the car parking in London now is mainly really that you provide it for people with disabilities and real need to use a car. But that, you know, if you want to use a car occasionally, then you use a car club or some other means. Food and drink was very important. So, you know, promoting the idea of, of local food and even food production within the site. Um, and they, had, they provided sort of places where people could order these sort of boxes of vegetables that could be delivered. So even if they're at work, there's a central place where each person can receive, receive their weekly little box of goodies and stuff like that. So it was all facilitated. A lot about water attenuation and capturing rainwater and then recycling grey water and so on. And waste similar to what I talked about before. Uh, biodiversity, a lot was done about sort of uh, re-establishing habitats and, and meeting, you know, community needs. Um, the Greenwich Millennium Peninsula, uh, which is, you know, the, you may have seen pictures of the, of the Millennium Dome, it's out there. This was absolutely, totally unusable contaminated land. So there were a lot of investment went into actually cleaning up the land first. But having done that, I mean, they, they absolutely transformed it. And Ralph Erskine, who's a Danish architect, um, he has worked in Britain for quite a bit. He In the 70s, he did a big famous thing called the biker wall up in Newcastle but he was brought into it and he he really believed that this should be a walking development that you know people should just not be relying on cars at all so everything was made but the also the very interesting aspect of it is that it was what we call sort of seamless tenure which meant that people could own their apartments or they could be renting or they could be in social renting sort of um, council housing but you wouldn't know 
which was which. And what developers nearly always revert to is, that's the market housing, it's super nice, that's the social housing, and it's obviously not as nice. And you're thinking, well, why do they have to be separate? And they said, oh, we have to because you, can't, you have to manage them differently and the people who live in the social housing are going to destroy it, so it's going to be more robust. So, you know, and here it's really showed that it worked. And the guy who took me around, I remember, he said, he showed me around, he says, you know, the only way you can ever tell or guess who might be who is by the quality of their curtains in the windows. Otherwise, you would never know. So in real integration of social mix, which has been very successful, and a huge sort of eco park, um, which has realized construction again, it was all about you know reusing materials. So it has a very attractive walkways, even at night, it's very well lit, you can get to um, you know, to the tube station and the buses and so on, and nice spaces all around. And this is part of the eco center where just you know, I don't think any animals had lived there for probably a century, and now there it's colonized with absolutely everything. And this is a really exciting space. Um, sustainable travel, I think we've kind of talked about before, and more diversity, energy again. I mean. You know, it was it was really about sort of across the lifetime of the project to really, really reduce energy consumption. Um, so I think sort of thinking about, you know, how did London change? I mean, I think there was a real un sense of uncertainty and discomfort in the late 90s before we had a mayor and a government for London that things were going badly wrong and that the city was being degraded because nothing had been invested in, nothing seemed to be working. Transport was highly negative, uh, you know, it was dirty and it was unattractive and the congestion obviously was huge um, and also lack of social housing because Margaret Thatcher had a sort of great idea that this incredible legacy that London had of social housing should be sold off so people who were living in council flats in cheap rent um, were allowed to buy their apartments for nothing and of course once you've lost that stock you have to replace it because there's always going to be people who who need that safety net and so it's been very difficult but it was very clear to Ken Livingston that it was necessary to re-provide that so in 2000, when, you know, when the uh, GLA was established, one of the first things he said to developers is, well, if you're developing housing, if you're developing, you know, 1,000 units, 50, 500 have got to be affordable housing. And the developers just fell about laughing and said, are you out of your mind? You know, we can't make money doing that. And uh, he said, well, you better try. And over the years, they did try. And more and more, we started seeing that they were getting very close to that 50% target. I mean, sometimes it was only 40 or 45. And they had the right to argue that if they were taking contaminated land and cleaning it up, that their profit margins were much lower and so on. So I think that was an important aspect of it. I think, you know, thinking about power um, and how how the city is going to, A, reduce its the need for power and reducing CO2 emissions and manage all all the aspects of the city that need power more efficiently was very important. And I think the key thing about the London Plan is that the sustainability is in all the policies. So if you look at the London Plan, you will see sustainability if you're looking at transport, if you're looking at housing, diversity, air quality, you know, uh, community issues, whatever it talks about, sustainability is always coming back. So that, you know, if you're doing a project, you, you're you likely to sort of be ticking three or four boxes, but they're all going to be sustainable boxes. So, you you, you know, if you're developing a, a mixed-use development, you're going to be thinking about the transport, but you're also going to be thinking about biodiversity, open space, all these things. But because they are so knitted together, you can't, Effectively, you can't miss them because they're there and they're and you're required to address them. Um, so I think it, you know, the fact that the policy was there, it forced the developers to change. It forced the, them to think differently, and the enlightened ones took it on board and have really realised that this is the way of the future. It's not just about kind of shoving up any old building and thinking that that's good enough. Um, I mean, I think the sort of key successes of London were obviously the Green Belt. We don't have s sprawl and we do have enough room within the city to accommodate the growth. Um, intensification is happening around the key nodes, so it's the equivalent to the, well, you call it TOD here, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> we call it something slightly different in England. But so, you know, getting that sort of 
but even if there isn't transport, because a lot of the opportunities for growth in London are not anywhere near transport nodes, so we can't always do that. But if they're not, then it's, it's beholden upon the developer to come up with the solutions for the transport. So they can't get away with a development that is not connected to the public transport system. So they either have to fund buses or create a bus link or put in a bridge or whatever it is that, that makes that place connected to the public transport system. Um, so I think strong governance was, was really important. A lot of power was invested in the mayor, and the mayor therefore is able, has clout, and that's been the really important thing to, to, tr to bring about this change and to stimulate the investment. I mean, the, everybody said n the developers and the business community are never going to talk to Ken Livingston because he was nicknamed Red Ken, and he was not, not thought to be a friend of the capitalist community, if you like put it really bluntly, but he understood that, you know, if London's economy doesn't work, London doesn't work. So he very quickly got talking to them and started to understand their needs and they were feeding their requirements to him and the dialogue was there. So Ken Livingstone was always about supporting London as a functioning city, not as a sort of a city pre preserved in aspect, aspect, but sort of a growing city that would be a world city. Um, and I, I talked about strong governance, I think probably covered all these points already. I think the key thing is, if you read the London Plan carefully, it's about creating a civilised city where people want to live, will enjoy to live, will have high quality lives and, and rich lives. That's it. High speed. I think oh, one o'clock. <laughs> okay. um, so, any questions? Yeah, any questions? Any questions? And just remember, um, Kale's got a microphone, so if you're in the back, just put your hand up and he can run and go. So, uh, any questions out there? Because if not, I'll, I'll actually start. Yeah, sure. Camilla. And one is, uh, looking at a lot of these projects, it was clear that there were both kind of public and private, private investment strategies that advanced them. Is Was this largely driven more by the public sector, some of these different development projects that you described? The housing projects? The housing projects and also some of the yeah. big transport projects because... Well, the transport projects obviously are driven by Transport for London. Transport for London is responsible for every transport mode in London with the exception of the little bit of the national rail where they kind of poke into London and end in the termini. Um, but even sort of orbital rail within London um, is run by Transport for London and they've spent sort of the last eight, ten years kind of hooking up loads of existing lines that were there from the 1800s to create an orbital rail system and put in brand new rolling stock and it opened about a sort of year and a half ago and it's just exponentially growing in success. It was when it, for the first, when it first opened, it, the ridership was increasing by 3% per week. So it's kind of already at capacity, but it's been hugely successful. But that was investment from Transport for London. They get their money from government, so they put it in their business plan and their application to government for money. Um, and so th that's really led almost 100% by Transport for London. They try to get in a little money from developers if they're developing over a station or something. But but in the, ha the two housing examples I showed, they were actually being funded by uh, the LDA, the London Development Agency, which was part of the original model for the GLA when it was set up. So it was, you know, there was going to be the mayor and there's going to be Transport for London and this third wing, which was going to really facilitate regeneration for all sorts of po various political reasons. That has now gone, but they were actually putting money in. So what they were doing was that they were partnering with the private sector. They were saying, well, we will be able to bring so many millions to the project and we'll have a steering group and we'll all talk about how we build in the sustainability objectives into the project. So, so that was more collaborative. Um, I think now uh, there's no money around, so it's either developers who are willing, but the investment and developers, you know, are still there and they're still building in London. Uh, so, you know, it is happening, but it's mainly, I guess, central, central money for transport, but private money for housing, yeah. Yeah. 
think the little microphone's on. Um, I'm a landscape architect and a planner, and so I, I was very interested in the you know the open space and concept of walkability and things like that that you've tried to put into the plan earlier on in the presentation there. Um, what my question, I guess, is whether you found that people are going out of their way to walk through green spaces. You said that people like to, you know, would like to walk these longer distances through green. Or are you trying to put green where people are already walking? And has that kind of uh, changed your definition of what is considered walking distance in the city? I guess locally, uh, London is made up of 33 boroughs, and the local boroughs are looking very closely at sort of where the desire lines are and trying to understand so looking at where the deficiencies in the green space are you know to if can you walk more or less in a straight line to get to the transport node or whatever and if there is a sort of you know an unattractive piece of city or you know rubble and leftover land that hasn't been developed that's been fenced off for years they will kind of look at you know they'll talk to who owns that land and try and open it up so it's very much about sort of thinking what are the needs of local people and that's developed very much at the local end i mean i think you know quite frankly i think if you develop green space that's not on people's desire lines they're not going to use it for transport they're going to use it for recreation so they'll go there at the weekends and in the evenings but if you want it to be part of the i i've always seen walking and public realm as part of the transport network and it's but it's got people are very determined particularly when they're going to work they want to get there quickly they don't want to waste time doing detours so it has to be on the desire line so it's about thinking and sometimes that means that you do have to link two spaces together along maybe a busy street but you can still beautify that street and make it attractive and enjoyable so but it's about thinking about getting direct connections to to make it work i think yeah hi my name is aaron dixon i'm a member of the uh national capital planning commission board uh first of all thank you for coming and thank you for a very very uh, interesting presentation uh and uh compliments on your successes <laughs> and your promises hopefully for the future what you're doing uh, I'm particularly interested, though, in the uh, diversity of your population and the ability to get the necessary political support, because you mentioned how important mm -hmm. government involvement might be, particularly with diverse community, to get that structured so you can get the political energy to keep things somewhat on track, even though we face economic crisis now. How is that working? What have you found that, yeah. could you speak to that just maybe a little? Yeah, I mean, I think the the big picture is that one of the first things that Ken Livingston did, he the big sort of square in the center of London, Trafalgar Square, was a traffic island. You couldn't get to it, but it was a big open space with two quite attractive fountains and the National Gallery, a very beautiful building at the back. You couldn't get to it. So he pedestrianized it. But having pedestrianized, he said, it's not just going to be a pretty place. It's going to be a usable place. And his focus was on having festivals for every ethnic community in London. So that immediate, so we now have Diwali and we have Jewish festivals and Indian festivals and remote things. Every community who has a festival can sort of apply to have their thing there. And I think that was very important in these communities feeling that they ha had value, that they were recognized, that they were visible. So that was the first thing. I think that was a really important thing that he did. But at, at the much more local level, so obviously some of the communities um, the immigrant communities are poor, you know, Nyum, which is a borough in the east, is where all the sort of Bangladeshi communities have been coming in, and, you know, the huge levels of unemployment and, you know, multiple deprivation and so on. And there, but the way these issues are being tackled is very much at the local level. It's thinking about what, what does this community need to be able to carry on its its cultural functions and interact with its own people and with other communities nearby and to try and so the emphasis is always on trying to think culture is used a lot but it's about accessibility and opening up and making sure that the cultural institutions that would support that community are properly there and properly represented so the you know faith buildings or just community centers and you know, different marriages in different communities vary so much. Could, can you actually have those marriages happening in your community? All that sort of stuff. And that's very much more at the local level. So the GLA will support that. But really, the, that's the local boroughs tend to be driving those things, unless it's part of a much bigger project. I don't think it's perfect. It's got a long way to go. But I think just having, you know, that 
Ken Livingston initiative of having the visibility and, and, and ethnic groups feeling comfortable about saying, this is what we do for our annual festival or whatever, was very important. And so I think, and it's helped a lot of other people understand what these different cultures do and, and get take part in it. So, I mean, these festivals, no means hogged by just one community. Everybody wants to be part of them because if it's a party, they're going to come. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Beth and I'm with the National Capital Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for coming. It was very interesting and I think we can draw a, a, upon a lot of it. Um, two questions. First, with, to deal with, you, you said you were looking to decentralize uh, energy yeah. and your energy plants. Um, first of all, when you do that, who's actually managing and running, running those individual plants? And two, did you run into any problems from your centralized utility provider? That's my um, first question. Well, the last question, no. I mean, uh, they seem to be remarkably, they probably don't believe it's really going to happen and put parts of them, <laughs> them out of business. I mean, I, I have not had that sense that there was any kickback there. The way, I mean, part, the one I showed was a pilot, so it was being funded also by the LDA, um, but they're still rolling it out and there's some investment going in, so it, it needed to be a pilot to demonstrate that okay. it worked for people to believe in it, because obviously, you know, if you if you can't haven't seen it work, the developers are just saying, "Oh, it's a waste of money. You're making us invest, then it's not going to work." But as very big developments are coming forward, um, they they're having to talk to the mayor and the GLA and parts of London where we know the big developments are going to come forward. The discussions were taking place with the developers to sort of say, "You know, we're expecting you to do this, so you need to do the research and you need to come to us and tell us how you're going to build it into your projects." And also there's been research by the GLA to think about, well, where actually, which sort of clusters in London have the real potential to make this work? Because you need the mix of different activities, you know, and the demand for electricity at different times of the day and all of this. But there's some very obvious places where that is. So they've all been identified. So as they come forward, you know, hopefully they will, will gradually, you know, be coming out sort of almost by themselves. But I think in the in the very big developments, I mean, there is a lot of pressure on them to to demonstrate how they're going to achieve it. And so I don't think they're really getting any funding for it. I mean, apart from the pilot study, uh, they're they're expected to kind of show or or at least argue that they can't deliver it and, and say why. You know, they can't just say we're not going to do it. Um, so. But I, I think it will be a slow process, but it's a completely obvious process, if yeah. you think of it, of sort of that heat and recycling the energy and, and you know, adjusting to different demand at different times in the 24-hour cycle. So it's just a matter of getting the infrastructure in. And I think, you know, ideally there should be government grants. And I, I was so depressed when I went to a presentation by some German, German government and other people, German Chamber of Commerce in London, and they were talking about geothermals, which is, you know, a step beyond. It's a much bigger thing. But in Germany, they're investing billions of euros into it. And anybody who has a house with a garden or something, they can come forward and say, I'd like to do a test to see if I can do geothermal in my garden. And they will get a grant to to do the borehole and to test it out. And even if it's not feasible, they don't have to pay back the grant, they, but they'll be advised, you know, you're not in the right place sort of thing. But this is happening all over. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they turned to the British counterpart and they said, well, so how, how much investment is there in London? And it was like, oh, it was 3,465p, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was just <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, and so I think we're way behind, actually, some of the European countries who are yeah. very advanced in that. We've got to think much more flexibly about energy and where it comes from and how we use it. And I think there's huge scope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe one more question and then we'll... Yeah. Anybody else? We... Oh, yeah. I'm a fellow English person myself. Oh, I and actually, I, I really uh, uh, appreciate you talking a little bit about even the biker wall because I am from Newcastle. So, uh, but the millennium. I, I do have a concern though about uh, people talking about the affordability of London, particularly the centre of London. Um, I know recently the cost of taking a, a, a bus is fairly expensive. And 
Um, I've heard that there's been an exit of many uh, people in certain boroughs further and further out of London. And there are also the sense that there's a lot of buildings in London that have been bought, foreign investment, people not living in them very much and, you know, leaving. And obviously that's occurring in every city. H how do you approach that problem? Yeah, I think, I think it's a real problem. Um, it, 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 I mean, I think it's outrageous that actually the, the high end, but it is the high end market that's being bought by foreigners who are clearly money laundering. It's very obvious that that's what's going on because they'll buy way over the market price just to be able to launder their money. Um, so that's worrying, but it is a very small part of the housing. So it's perhaps we shouldn't worry too much. I mean, it's, a, it's an ethical issue, but I guess we don't need perhaps to worry about it too much. I think the cost of housing in London is prohibitive, and that's why we've got to get much more affordable housing and intermediate housing. Because, um, as you say, you know, policemen, teachers, the key workers are finding it harder and harder to live in London. Um, and for young professionals now, it's very typical that they stay living with their parents. They can't afford to move out and so on. So I think that is an issue, you know. Uh, so I think more affordable housing is needed. And unfortunately, sort of at the moment with the crunch, credit crunch, it's sort of like the delivery of affordable housing as an issue and a topic is been kind of almost swept under the carpet. And a lot of developments I've heard now recently are coming forward, they're only having 15% affordable housing or something, which really isn't good enough. Um, so that's a huge issue. I think we have to address it. The cost of travel, I mean, I think it's outrageously expensive. And my kids used to harangue me when I was at Transport for London. How can you allow this? You know, it's so expensive. We can't afford it on our pocket money. We can't go anywhere. And, and it's true, it is terribly expensive. And when you look to look to Europe, the investment per capita in public transport in countries like Germany and France is three or four times what it is in Britain. And I think the reality is we don't subsidize the transport enough to be able to get it down to affordable levels. So that's what I would like to see happen. But you know, whether, whether it happens or not. I mean, Transport for London tries very hard to keep the prices down but they keep creeping up. And they are saying, well, we are being told that we have to renew the stock. There, there are costs that Transport for London can't avoid. You know, the renewal of the assets and the renewal of the underground, it's a constant drain on their resources. The amount that they can put into subsidizing. Bus fares are subsidized, I think, about 50%. I mean, it's huge investment already, but it's just not enough. So. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, and I think as a society, we've got to really ask, you know, how, how much of the average per capita income should, should one actually have to spend on getting to and from work? You know, I mean, it's, it, it's a necessity, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a difficult question. <laughs>